Hi, and welcome to another episode of Life Plus. I'm your host, Dr. Marilyn Johnson, and you know, as we age, there is an issue dealing with driving. Sometimes families are concerned about themselves or their elders who may be having a little bit of slowdown reflex. Medical issues could be a concern, but today we're going to check it out and see what's going on with a visit to Taggart's Driving School. All right, Marilyn. <laughs> Come on, hand them over. Hand oh, them over. no, I'm no. about you. No, really Audrey, am. it's I not am. time yet. Let's go to the driving school and I'll get evaluated. Right. How about it? All right. Okay. Give a try. All right, then stay with us. <laughs> Remember when you got the keys? Life was never the same. Freedom, independence, and, well, fun. his own reckless driving habits, Mr. Robinson made it a point to urge his son to drive carefully and to observe all the traffic rules. But this driver's ed film from the 70s came with a warning about having too much fun, being distracted, careless, and that was long before cell phones. His son had faithfully kept their agreement right up to the time of the accident. Now, many of us are facing a tough decision. How do we take the keys away from the very person who first handed them to us? How do we even bring up the subject? And what about us, the baby boom generation? How do we take the steps now to keep ourselves, our loved ones, and others safe when we're behind the wheel? to Tom's own attitude towards speeding. It's hard to miss the headlines. Yet another older man or woman plows into a crowd. A gas pedal mistaken for a brake pedal, and there are deadly consequences. The numbers appear to support the stories. In 2012, drivers 65 or older were involved in 204 fatal crashes in Georgia. The Governor's Office of Highway Safety's Older Driver Task Force also says one in five deaths of occupants that is, people inside a car involved a driver 65 or older. And it's estimated that by 2025 in Georgia, motor vehicle crashes will account for the second leading cause of unintentional injury deaths among older adults age 65 and older. The first, falls. With the aging of the baby boom generation, some 74 million people who were born between 1946 and 1964, and with 8,000 baby boomers turning 65 every day, concerns over aging drivers are rising. Some see business opportunities with services like Uber and Common Courtesy, and some see ways to empower elders and their family members to make changes to be able to stay behind the wheel and stay independent longer. Okay, let's, uh, before we get started, let's make sure you're comfortable. Check out With me, Dr. Marilyn Johnson, behind the training wheel to see what a driver's test for seniors is like, we also got the 411 from folks who deal with safe driving daily. Daryl Shivers, a driving instructor for 11 years with Taggart's. Pat Dutter, a 10-year veteran who, by the way, chose to conduct our interview. Also, with Audrey seated in an instruction car. We also talked with Garrett Townsend of AAA. Here's what they told us. Old age by itself isn't a handicap. First, Daryl Shivers. Well, get them evaluated, just like we do here. Uh, have somebody take them out, they certified like we are, and just ride with them, and it, it doesn't take long to find out whether they can drive or not. I had a student, another, a man student, uh, a while back. He had trouble getting in and out of the car. He had, he had a crutch. But once he got in the car, he could drive. He had any problem. He couldn't walk very well, but he could drive. Still, some signs of slowing down that can come with age can be telling. First of all, you just kind of look at them physically. You can tell pretty much what kind of shape they're in. Uh, for example, uh, <clears throat> last year I had an older lady that uh, had had a stroke, 
And uh, you could tell immediately that she had problems with walking. She had, had trouble getting in the car, trouble getting out of the car. And uh, she had some problems with the eyes that I did not know about at that time. We got on the road driving around and found out that she stayed on the left side of the road instead of the right side of the road. And I had to continually put her back in the right lane. So I found out she also had eye problems. So uh, she, was, uh, she was really, really uh, bad off and uh, she, couldn't, uh, she couldn't drive. I had to tell them that she couldn't, she couldn't do it. Knowing that she would likely lose her independence if she failed, he says, it was heartbreaking. She was wanting to get out and drive, but she just, she just wasn't able. She put, just wasn't, wasn't quite there yet. With time, you know, she might be able to drive later on with more physical therapy or whatever they do to help her with a condition to improve her condition. But right then, she was not ready. Painful, says AAA's Garrett Townsend, but it's necessary to notice the signs. Some of the things that they'd want to look for is if they're having uh, frequent fender benders, um, if uh, people are getting behind them sort of blowing the horn quite a bit, which means they could be uh, driving unsafely or too uh, slow. Uh, could be some of the warning signs that uh, maybe they need to uh, consider some driving courses. Or maybe consider selling the car, though that might not solve the problem as Pat Dutter discovered. A very good friend of mine um, her father was retired military, and he was in his 80s. And she went to visit him, and they went to uh, one of the clubs to be able to have lunch, an officer's club, and he drove. And she said it was the ride from Dante's Inferno. She was petrified. So when she got home, she sat her dad down and said, you know, Dad, I just don't think you should be driving anymore. And of course, he became very angry and very hostile and very hurt. And he said, you know, I'm the adult and I'm going to drive. And she said, no, Dad, you are the adult, but you're going to put somebody at risk. So she took the keys and she ended up selling his car. Hopefully, that day will be in the distance. If you take precautions now, including unlearning some of the things you might have learned back in driver's ed. Okay, now, you know where you're supposed to hold the wheel? Where your hand's supposed to be on the wheel? Right here, 10 and 2? That's the old technique. Oh. No longer 10 and 2. Okay. The new, the new thing is 9 and 3. Okay. Thumbs up. 9 and 3. Nine, okay. 9 and 3, thumbs up. You know why that is? Yeah, it gets you more grip. No. Uh -huh. Add a bag in here. Uh -huh. 9 and 3, thumbs up. Okay. Now, if you got your thumbs down, and the airbag pops out, it can break your thumb off. Oh my so that's God. why they say keep your thumbs up, nine and three. Okay. Then you're not going to lose your thumb. Okay. okay. And even with one's hands properly placed on the wheel, the most common factors for older drivers in all crashes, those that involved a death and those that did not, involved failing to yield right of way, including improper left-hand turns, failing to keep the proper lane, and following too close. That said, AAA says older drivers are not the only ones on the road contributing to dangerous driving. Some of the things that sometimes you, you uh, underestimate uh, as far as proper uh, adjustment in the car, making sure that they're properly fitted, uh, sometimes by uh, making a series of turns in opposed to uh, making a left-hand turn, making a series of right-hand turns could uh, possibly be better for them. And then to look out for the warning signs, potentially things that uh, could be, uh, if, the, if their peripheral vision is off, if they're not seeing the road as good as they used to, uh, those are the signs potentially that they can look for. But just overall, good driving skills that we could all use. The fact is, is that older drivers, senior drivers, in many cases, are better than some of the younger drivers. Here's the reason why. Some of the factors that we look at with driving and, and um, crashes is distracted driving. Uh, potentially cell phones or other things, adjusting the radio. Those are things generally that seniors don't do. So in many cases, a senior is a safer driver than a younger person because they don't have necessarily those distractions. Still, they may have others, including the possibility of using medications that may have an impact on driving performance, 
which is why AAA created RoadWise RX, so that seniors and anyone can check. And that's something that sometimes people underestimate, how prescription medications uh, can have a negative or detrimental impact on their driving skills. And that's why an open, honest conversation is key. It's not an intervention. This is not a situation where the family comes together because what happens in many cases like that, people get defensive and it becomes a very difficult conversation. Uh, so it is, a, it is a conversation and privacy is important. Uh, this isn't something necessary that the person, the, the child or the grandchild needs to get out the list of medications to show you know, why this could be dangerous. It's a conversation, but most of all it is concern uh, for that uh, person, for that senior. To stay in the driver's seat, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention offer some suggestions. Exercise regularly to increase strength and flexibility. Ask your doctor or pharmacist to review medicines, both prescription and over-the-counter, to reduce side effects and interactions. Have your eyes checked by an eye doctor at least once a year. Wear glasses and corrective lenses as required. Drive during daylight and in good weather. Find the safest route with well-lit streets, intersections with left turn arrows and easy parking. Plan your route before you drive. Leave a large following distance behind the car in front of you. Avoid distractions in your car such as listening to a loud radio, talking on your cell phone, texting, and eating. Consider potential alternatives to driving, such as riding with a friend or using public transit that you can use to get around. And speaking of alternatives, the Atlanta Regional Council has created a trip planning website called simplygetthere.org, where seniors and others can get information on taxis, public transit, and other special transportation services, because Let's face it, nobody's getting any younger. Pat Duggars offers some insights. I don't think there's any doubt that I think it's going to be a stepped process. I think there are things that we are dealing with now that other generations didn't have to. Back in the day, people died much earlier. So because they weren't living longer, they didn't develop a lot of the diseases that we now see. They didn't develop a lack of um, independence. So you were 60 or 62, you retired from your job, maybe you lived a year if you were lucky, you traveled and that was it. So we didn't have the need to have the rules in place. Now as we are a society that is living longer, I think now we're going to have to pay attention to the aging population. And I think we're going to need to seek alternatives. Everything from um, good, solid means of transportation, and to do it in a manner and in a way that doesn't demean somebody's uh, freedom and independence. When we return, Jane Ratliff of Blue Hair Technology Group will have our tech tip. Plus this. This is obviously 14 karat from the 1950s. These baby boomers have eyes for spotting the gems, and for turning your tarnished heirlooms into sparkling items you might want to salvage rather than toss. Life Plus will be back in a moment. Welcome back to Life Plus. This is Audrey Galix. Perhaps you were lucky, like me, to inherit jewelry and other items from your late loved ones. But there comes a time when you might wish to part from the gifts left by the dearly departed. That's when you might wish to visit people like Anne Epstein Jeffries, a third-generation jewelry appraiser, to find out should it stay or should it go. People have inherited and people bring me, you know, a box of jewelry to go through and sometimes they have no idea what's real, what's not, and sometimes it's mixed together. Every once in a while it's all not real and they didn't know that. And <laughs> um, but, you know, usually there's a few good pieces mixed in and it's usually the older pieces are big by today's standards so people don't want to wear it. I had somebody recently that um, it was all real, probably about 75 pieces and um, all real, all huge 
just not, not wearable by the average mom today. So there we go. So. And perhaps you inherited some silver pieces, candlesticks, flatware, and have no clue about their value. A place like Beverly Bremer Silver Shop can help. Um, tea was very popular. And sugar, the reason this sugar bowl is so big is because sugar was not refined. So it was in bigger chunks. So it was Mimi Woodruff is one of the store founder's children. She runs the shop, which is celebrating its 40th year. You wanted to have a big, beautiful display of it. And she started it when she was a single mother, divorced, three children. And she had a set of silver and a couple of other things. And she really, out of necessity, went to go sell them. So she went to go to a, she went to a pawn shop originally to sell it. And she was made an offer based on the value of the metal. And she recognized that it was a, a popular pattern, Francis the First. And so she thought, you know, I, maybe there are friends of mine who might be looking for some of these things. And so she said to the man, well, this is a great pattern. It's Francis the First. But he was really considering it more for the metal value. So he said, well, you might want to go find those people that need this. So she took her own set of silver to a local flea market and started there and put it all out. And some people were missing a fork, some were missing a knife, some were missing a spoon. So that's how she started. And she went back to that pawn shop and started uh, going through the stuff that he had and recognized the patterns and built her inventory that way. But it's a very useful piece, and we can brighten this up and polish it for awesome. you. Awesome. Great, well. great. So here's the <laughs> On the day of our visit, groom-to-be Kip Thompson brought in flatware and other silver items inherited from his fiancée's grandmother. And he learned a lesson about an heirloom we can all take home. I think the, the stigma or the really stereotype of this stuff is very fancy and you can only use it then, but I eat a lot of cereal and it's good to know that <laughs> I can use it for everyday cereal. <laughs> That's right, use it or repurpose it, even a silver or silver-plated tea set. Particularly in, with respects to a tea set, we don't entertain like that much anymore. People are not at home at four o'clock entertaining their friends with a little light tea, but the, the object itself is a beautiful decorative accessory. It is a piece of American craftsmanship, the quality of design that cannot be reproduced today. And they are a beautiful addition to any sideboard. People can look at them and use them and enjoy them. The, the cream and sugar are very useful. Um, and if you're ever serving coffee after dinner, you can use the coffee pot alone. So you have to think of new ways to use these things. A visit to the shop is like a visit to a living museum where you'll learn that silver pieces made in America before 1865 were melted down coins, the ultimate recyclable. And there is a way to tell whether a piece is silver, which is solid metal, or silver plated, that is, a thin layer over a base metal, meaning there is no recoverable metal. If you turn a piece over, it will usually have the word sterling, possibly a manufacturer's mark, on the back of flatware, all of the flatware that is sterling has the word sterling written sort of in the neck of the spoon or the neck of the fork. Um, knife handles are generally hollow handle and have a stainless steel blade. And you know that expression, to be born with a silver spoon in one's mouth? Get this. Silver has natural antibacterial properties and that does not allow germs to breed. So when you said somebody was born with a silver spoon in their mouth, it referred to the, to the fact that the child would be healthy, that they would not be using a, a utensil that allowed germs to breed. People used to eat with wooden forks and spoons and different kinds of utensils. Then they began to use silver and the natural properties of the antibacterial properties of silver was useful and helpful to ensure a child's good health. And then it became a symbol of wealth later. And just as receiving or registering for silver might have been an expected rite of passage for some young brides, what about a young lady's gift of grandma's pearls? You might be sorely disappointed. The pearl market has changed so much now with freshwater pearls. Um, they, you know, they're, they're so inexpensive compared to cultured saltwater pearls. That's, again, people think, well, grandma's pearls, mom's pearls, they were so valuable. Well, they yellow over time or they weren't top quality to begin with. So now 
you know, everyone has their grandmother's yellow pearls. <laughs> and usually they were smaller than what people like to wear today. So again, that all you know, figures into the value and can't do much with, with old pearls. And sadly, some siblings squabble over silver and jewels, which in some cases isn't worth the bickering. It was a lot when they bought it, but not, you can't necessarily get everything out of it that, you, that it was purchased for. Um, I mean, the jewelry you know, increases over time, but not, not quite enough that people think they have thousands and thousands, and I have to tell them it's more like hundreds. But then there are heirlooms that are difficult to put any price on. For grins, I asked to have these precious items identified. If he really knows his stuff. These are probably contemporary. <gasps> contemporary? 20th century. Ah, and, 20th uh, century. Beer signs, and it's five o'clock somewhere. Well, let's go. There we go. First. The bottom line, would you use it or? Would you wear it? That's, so that's the question for would you, do you want to keep it? Would you wear it? Perhaps you'd like to snap a shot of your newly polished silver heirloom and send it to a sibling. Here's Jane Ratliff with our Tech Talk to show you how. Hi, this is Jane Ratliff with Blue Hair Technology Group. And today's Tech Talk is going to be about how do you attach a picture that you've taken with your iPad or maybe even your iPhone, how do you attach a picture to an email and send it to your friends? It's really very simple. And we're gonna walk through those steps now. So I'm gonna take my iPad out, uh, I will unlock it. And since we're gonna send an email, the first thing we're going to do is actually open up our email app. So we're gonna tap on the email app. We're going to create a new email by tapping the icon up at the top and up comes your email dialog box. We're going to address it to whoever we want. So I'm gonna address it to my friend up here. Put the subject in, I'll just say picture. And then I tap my finger down in the body of the email. I'm gonna move this down a little bit so I don't touch the screen in any funny way. And down in the body of the email, I tapped and held it just for a minute. I'll show you again. You press and hold and release, you come up with a bunch of options to do. And the very last one says, insert video, photo or video. And we are actually gonna tap on that. It immediately opens up your picture albums. I have moments, all photos, favorites, and I can swipe up and down in here. So don't be concerned about that. So what you need to do now is find that picture. All photos is probably the best place to go. I'll tap on that. And you'll see that you can actually scroll through all the pictures that are in your photo album. I know the picture that I want though, it's the most recent one. So I'm going to tap on that picture and a little bit bigger picture comes up of that picture I selected. And then down here, actually across the top, the word use appears. So I like the picture, that's the one I wanna send. I'm gonna say use. And it inserted the picture into the email. Now I'm all ready to send it. I can also go to the very bottom of that picture, tap my finger, and I can type, I can type whatever I like. I can say something like, isn't this great? You can actually put words in there as well. You're done. You send the picture like you normally would. You tap send. And off it went. Now there's a second way, and you might find this easier. There's a second way to send an email. A, excuse me, a picture in an email. That is by going to your photos first. So we're going to find the photos app first. And I'll see if I can find this quickly. If you can't find the Photos app quickly, I'll show you a shortcut. You actually swipe up from the bottom, which brings up your control panel, and you tap on the camera, which is right here. And inside the camera, as you know, you always have the ability to look at your pictures. 
I can tap on my picture. And now I'm actually in this area where all my pictures are located. So I'm gonna find the picture that I wanna send. So I've actually opened up my photos. Let's say I wanna send this picture to somebody. In the very bottom left of the screen is an icon, it's called the share icon. And it's a square with a little arrow in it. I tap on that. It brings me to what I call the dialog box of the apps that I want to share that picture with. And I here is your mail app right away, the mail app. So if I tap mail, it inserts the picture into my email program. It brings me back up to the two where I can type in the person I want to send it to with the option of picture, I mean the subject line of picture. And again, just hit the send button and off it goes. So it's very easy. Once you have the picture in your iPad or on your iPhone, you have two ways that you can send that picture. You either go to your email app first, press and hold, and up comes that line that where you say insert photo, select the photo and insert it, or you can actually go to the picture first and select the share button. That will then bring up the option of the app that you want to share it by, which is the mail app and you do the same thing. You enter the person's email address, the subject, and hit the send button or done button. So that's how you share pictures on your iPad as well as your iPhone. I'm Jane Ratliff with Blue Hair Technology Group. See, I get to keep my keys. I passed the test. I hear you did very well, Marilyn. <laughs> I'm proud of you. I'm happy for you. Well, you know, it's really, really important if you want to keep rolling to keep your driving skills up to date by having a driving evaluation. It's such an important thing. But if and you're concerned, you know, be proactive about it. Don't, don't wait. That's right. That's right. Just make sure that you keep everything rolling, keep it all together so you can keep living life plus. So thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. And remember, driving, moving about really does help you to live life plus. Wanna take a spin? See you later. Oh, let's get the seatbelts on.